All right, let's get going tonight on, on a lesson I'm titling Christ the Priest. This is our technically our third lesson in this little four-lesson mini-series we're doing on Prophet, Priest, and King. That was the title of the first one. For those who are maybe jumping in late, Prophet, Priest, King described Israel's journey through the Old Testament, through the eras of the priest, in this order actually, the priest, the king, the prophet, and then we closed that lesson with how Jesus is the culmination of those three things in the New Testament, how he's the fulfillment, the climactic ending to Israel's story. And we used Revelation, which describes Jesus in terms that listed out, list him out as a prophet, priest, and king without ever actually using those titles. However, the New Testament is saturated with Jesus as the prophet. Last week we looked at Jesus the prophet and what it would mean if Jesus is the prophet. And then tonight, the priest. The New Testament is a little less saturated with Jesus as the priest. Um, and I want to dig into why tonight. I want to also, I want to dig in, of course, to the Old Testament as to why we even call him the priest at all. Why is that important that he be the priest? And did any of the other New Testament writers outside of Hebrews, and that's not a spoiler alert because I told you a week ago, get ready, Hebrews is going to be prominent. It is. It's very prominent when you talk about Jesus as the priest because the book of Hebrews really specializes in that. But is there anything else outside of that? We'll look at that in the New Testament as well. So to get started tonight, let's jump straight into the text, into a, a passage that is the first spot in Hebrews, but not the last. We're going to read a bunch of Hebrews tonight. The first spot where we have Jesus as a priest is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14, 15, 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. It's a very, un, uh, very unambiguous line there in, in verse 14. There's no, he's leaving no doubt as to who, what he thinks Jesus is, that Jesus the Son of God is also a great high priest. Let's hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is one of Hebrews' most famous contributions to the New Testament. That's this passage of Scripture, particularly that 16th verse, that we get to come boldly. We all, we, my Pentecostal heritage used that every time we came to church. We get to come boldly to the throne of grace. And we said it every time we sang worship songs. And every time someone prayed, we were all urged to come boldly to the throne of grace. Um, it was rarely explained what that looked like, why we were able to be bold, or what happened when we got there. But we sure did run in boldly. Um, let's do a little better job tonight, though, than just saying go boldly to the throne of grace. Um, one of the things that you'll notice from the very beginning is that this is the first spot, as far as I can see, that Hebrews really locks in on Jesus as the priest. And as I told you before, it's the book that really does that. So whoever writes Hebrews, maybe it's Paul. It's probably not. It's not his style in the Greek. Uh, there's really good evidence it's someone else. Whoever he or she is, and there is actually a little evidence that it might have been a, a female. Um, I'll leave that alone for arguments purposes. Whoever he or she or they are, they're taken with this idea. For them, the story of Christ is that Jesus is the ultimate high priest. And in being the ultimate high priest, he takes care of all of the priestly duties that, that Israel was used to in Judaism. And so that now that Jesus has become the high priest, all the other stuff, tab tabernacles and temples and angels and, and mediators and sacrifices and lambs and blood and anointing oils, all of it finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Hebrews is the one who sort of pulls all of that. He kind of, imagine the author just reaching into all these little Judy, Judaism worship things and theologies. And he's just grabbing all of them and sliding them all into Jesus. And his title for the, he, he uses this style. He or she uses this style. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than the temple. Jesus is better than the law. It's always better than, better than, better than. We'll get into some better thans tonight. But at the end of the day, what it is, is Jesus is the high priest the highest of high priests, the last high priest, better than the rest of them. And if you've already got the best, why would you ever need a sub-priest? And so the, the argument then culminates up in Jesus. But, but one thing I do notice that I think is worth pointing out right here is that the author wants to make sure that we see Jesus not only as a high priest, but as a man. And the very fact that he calls him a priest is really significant in seeing Jesus in his humanity, not his divinity. 
And that's not a throwaway line. So let me say it again and lock in a little bit better. The author of Hebrews wants you to see Jesus in his, Jesus in his humanity more than you see Jesus in his divinity because if he's divine, that doesn't speak to the metaphor of priest. To be priest, you have to be human. You're from among the other humans. You represent the humans to God, but you can't be divine and be the priest because you're not really represent. You are not, you can't sympathize with their weakness. You weren't tempted like they were. You don't feel the pain they feel. So the author is putting Jesus in a sympathetic position by making him human. By making him high priest, he's made him a human who represents humanity to God. That, that, that leads us to the breakdown we try to do every week. And this is not an exhaustive breakdown, but it's mine. And that is that the priest does a few things. So if you walk away from these lessons with anything, then it could be maybe these, these things each week. Because then you've got it all sort of in a nutshell. Um, the first one is a little complex, and I'll... I'll I won't get too deep into it until a little bit later, but the priest is a mediator or a representative between God and man. And note that the word representative is in parentheses because it's another way of saying mediator that I want to save for a little bit. But in a nutshell, the priest on that first line is the one who runs between, stands between humanity and God. Think of Flip that. Think about the prophet. What would we tell you? The prophet is the one who stands between God and humanity. The mouthpiece for God. Speaking as if from the mountain down into the people. That's the prophet's job. Reminding the people what God said. When you flip that, you've got at the bottom of it the priest. Representing the people upwards to God. Because not every person under the old covenant or under any religious structure, this is, Christ really codifies this in a way that is unique. That the people don't have individual accesses to God. There's too many hurdles to jump, too many ladders to climb. And so they used priests who represented them or mediated between them and then did the second thing, led them through Scripture, through sermons, through sacrifice, through religious ritual, the priesthood led people to the gods because priests are not unique to Judaism. Okay? Prophets are not unique to Judaism. Neither are unique to Christianity. These are, these are representatives of religious cultures across the world and across time. Priests come to represent the body to the gods, to God, in Judas, in Judea's case, Yahweh, and so the author of Hebrews then puts Christ in there then as the one that leads us to God as mediator. And then finally, and we'll end here tonight, fittingly, combats guilt. And so what's the purpose of the priest if not to offer sacrifices? What are the purpose of sacrifices if not to deal with the collective guilt of the nation or on the individual basis to deal with the individual guilt of the sacrificer or the offerer. And so the priest becomes the liaison by which guilt can be transferred and becomes the centerpiece of the judgment system. Kind of falls, almost funnels in through the priest. Um, let's see how Hebrews lands here. Because we don't get to, we don't get to interview these authors. We don't get to sit down with the author of Hebrews and say, you're the only one that came up with it because this is unique, uh, unique and original in the book of Hebrews. No other New Testament writer calls Jesus the priest. So if we could sit down with the author of Hebrews and go, how'd you come up with that? What led you there? Well, our easy answer is, well, the Holy Spirit led him there. Okay, uh, you say that's an easy answer. Well, it's the best one we would have, except it's a book written to Hebrews. So the, the, he's, he's drawn from scripture like crazy. So where might he derive this, this idea of the priest? Um, let's go back to the Psalms. This is the songbook of Israel. I want to show you Psalms chapter 110, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. We've talked a little bit about right hand. Jesus talks about the right hand. 
who gets to set up my right hand and my left? This is king talk. Set up my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Three. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. And the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And this is the moment in the Old Testament where an old, ancient, obscure character from the book of Genesis, I call him obscure because he's in one story. He doesn't last but one brief scene on biblical history, and that's a man, a mystery man called Melchizedek. Abraham comes back from battle and brings the spoils of war and is met by the king of Salem, king of peace, whom he calls Melchizedek. Guy comes out of nowhere, almost like a figure that just walks through the wall to Abraham, into the story. And Abraham gives 10%, first mention of tithe in the Bible, gives the tithe to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses him. And they even share, there's even evidence there, they share the first communion. It's not the body and blood of Jesus, but it's probably bread and wine. There's a meal exchange. This is covenantal. This will all come to bear Jesus' priesthood. And then Melchizedek's gone. He's just this guy. And there's no Aaron priest yet. There's just Melchizedek, the first priest in the Bible. And then you get, and he's, he's gone from biblical history. There's no prophecy about him. There's no refer, re, uh, stories referring to him. There's no side story about him. And then Psalm 110 drops. And all of a sudden, at the end of verse 4, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. There is no order of Melchizedek. Okay? We, we read this through New Testament eyes. But stop doing that for a minute. This is why I read this first. Because you know this is coming up in Hebrews. But I want you to see this first, because that's what they would have seen. And what they saw is a quote about the order of Melchizedek. Who is you? You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Who's the you? Well, no one knew. No one knew who the you was. It's not as if it says Jesus. It's not as if it says there's a Messiah coming who will be a priest. According. No one knew who you was. Go back one screen, Brian. I just want to show you one more thing. I emphasize this, but I want to do it again. This is how this psalm starts. And they would have known the words because they knew the melodies. The Lord said to my Lord, set at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Okay? That's how the song starts. Set at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then inside the song, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Look how the author of Hebrews starts his letter. Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, he has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He also made the worlds. Three. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Hebrews opens his letter with shades of the first line of Psalm 110 that he's going to set at the right hand. And he even hints in Hebrews 1 that he does it by purging our sins. That's a priestly role, a role of taking the blood of an animal and putting it on the altar and through that sacrificial role, purge the sins of whomever had brought their animal. Because the Old Testament Levitical code was that you brought your animal in, if it was a sin offering, and the priest laid his hands on the head of the animal. And it was on that animal that all of the judgment was to go upon instead of the offerer. You were offering the animal in exchange for whatever you... The animal hadn't done anything wrong. But it was offered as a sacrifice, that which stood in between. And then that blood is presented by the priest. And so Hebrews opens with, he sat down at the right hand. He's offered the blood. And so, let me that next screen. The author doesn't start with Jesus as the priest. But rather he starts with Jesus seated at God's right hand. And I think he does that because that's how Psalm 110 opens. 
Seated at the right, whoever's seated at the right hand, they get to be the priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the author of Hebrews begins where Psalm 110 begins. He puts at the right hand of God, Jesus, a position of authority, but he's using it as a preface to a new kind of priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. Let's see that order from Hebrews 7. Now, I, I want to, don't let this scare you. 11 to 25 is a lot of verses, I know. And that's more than we can do in a night. And I promise we won't give it the full treatment, which is good and a bad thing. It's good for timing. It's bad for not getting the full treatment, right? Um, I wanted you to see, and I had a few reverses, but I want you to see the body of this to, for the best of my ability that the author of Hebrews just gives in. He's worked this a little bit. He's hinted. Get chapter 4, and he get pulls back in a little bit about being a priest. And all of a sudden in chapter 7, he just throws all of his chips on the table to the point that he literally goes all the way back to the, I won't even read this part. He goes all the way back to the Genesis story, and he tells a little bit of that Abraham Melchizedek stuff. And he goes, Abraham's paying tithes Melchizedek, and, and in Abraham was all of his children, and therefore his children were paying tithes through him to Melchizedek, which has become a big tithe chapter in churches. Because if Abraham was tithing to Melchizedek before the law, you ought to be tithing to God after the law. An argument that's not made a lot of sense to me because they were also killing animals before the law, but you don't still kill animals after the law. Why is it that you don't still kill animals? Because of PETA or because of Jesus? <laughs> well, maybe both, but definitely because of Jesus. And so Jesus then becomes a fulfillment. So. The author of Hebrews then wants to put Jesus in as the place of Melchizedek. So he throws all of his chips on the table and, he, and, and goes all in in this passage beginning, I'll start in 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, parenthetical passage, for under it the people received the law. Okay, if the law could make you perfect, pretty good opener. If the law could make you perfect, what further need was there? that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. Time out. Whoever said there was a need for another priesthood to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? The author of Hebrews is the first person that ever said this. But not really, because the author of Hebrews grabs Psalms 110, verse 4, where there's an obscure moment in which someday there's going to be someone who's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, an order that's never existed before. And so the author of Hebrews sees that whoever is sitting at the right hand also gets the dubious title, the never before heard title of priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the author of Hebrews goes, well, if there's going to be a priest like Melchizedek, why? We already have the priesthood of Aaron. Why would we bother with another priest after the order of Melchizedek if we have the priesthood after the order of Aaron? It's a good question. And that's what he asks. Why would we even need another priest? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, and this is one of my most, to me, this is one of the big, big booming verses of the New Testament, as far as new covenant people should be concerned, is Hebrews 7, 12. If the priesthood changed then you have to change the law. If the priesthood is no longer through Aaron, then the Levitical code that rotated around the Aaronic, Aaronic priesthood, if he's no longer the centerpiece, but this is Melchizedek. Who's Melchizedek? What? Psalms 110, whoever's sitting at the right hand. If you're going to change the priest, you should change the law. So everything changes if you change the priesthood. This is what I meant about the Hebrew, author of Hebrews just throwing all of his chips in, going, okay. We're going to call him the one? We're going to call him a priest after the order of Melchizedek? All right. Then we got to get rid of all the Aaron stuff. This, there's no playing on both sides of this. There's no going, oh, we got the new one, but we still use the old. Goes, What's the point? What's the point of using the old if you have a new? Why even bring a new? And by the way, this is all just good metaphor to get him to a new covenant. He's just leading his audience all the way up to the advent of a new covenant. So if the priesthood changed, then we change the law. 13. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord Jesus arose from Judah. See, the author of Hebrews is convinced 
Jesus is the order of Melchizedek. He is the new priest. The problem is you got to be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest. And Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So the author knows he's got a problem because I can't make Jesus the priest. He's from the wrong tribe. But remember what he just told you. If you change the tribe, you can change the law. If you change the priesthood, you can change the law. Are we okay, though, just putting Jesus in as a priest if he's from the wrong tribe? This is the argument that is running into in verse 14, 15. And it's yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So the priesthood that I'm attributing to Jesus, I'm speaking as the author of Hebrews now, how dare I, but I will. The priesthood that I'm attributing to Jesus through the order of Melchizedek is not through fleshly command because he's from the wrong tribe, but it's through the power of an endless life, endless life, endless. And we're talking about the one who died and rose again, but the author of Hebrews is speaking from the other side of the resurrection. Okay, that's good. That's important. It's coming back in a moment. Power of an endless life, 17. Pre testifies. Oh, look at this. Psalms, Psalms 110.4. You're a priest forever according to your Melchizedek. And here's where he's drawing his source. This is his one verse. This is where he gets his power. And he goes, I'm just going to say it. Psalms 110, verse 4 is about Jesus. And he, by making that declaration, the New Testament now has props up Jesus as high priest. It's used the one verse it had from the Old Testament to do it and the one story it had from Genesis to do it. And the author of Hebrews rises and falls on this argument. Okay? This is why when I say Jesus the priest, the whole argument of Jesus being the priest is here. And if he's the priest, then everything's changed. If he's not, then maybe everything hasn't changed. And I think the author of Hebrews is doing the same thing. Centerpiece of his book right here. You're about the midpoint, by the way, in the book of Hebrews. He's really built it all to this, and then he's going to really take off. According to the order of Melchizedek, on the one hand, we annul the former commandment because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. That's quite a statement. This is why some people think this book is Paul, because that's kind of the way Paul talks. You know, like the law is weak for righteousness. You try to be justified by the works of the law. Christ died in vain. The law is, un is weak. It's unprofitable. 19, because the law didn't make anything perfect. On the other hand, there's the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. On the other hand, I mean, on one hand, there's the law. It, can't, it, doesn't, it doesn't fix stuff. And then over here, you've got hope that even if this isn't going to work, this isn't going to fix me, but this, this, Let's me draw near to God. What did I tell you was the second feature of the priest leads us to God. Okay. So Hebrews is using priest talk, inserting Jesus in it. Go, we got a better hope, leads us to God in as much as he was not made priest without an oath. 21. For they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, I don't want to get in the weeds here, so we're going to move. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Quotes the same verse. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. I want to pause right here for a second. Um, sneak attack. Hapax legomenon pops up right here on... Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Um, we could have used this one in the Haypack series. We did not, so we'll throw it in there tonight. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Um, had we used it, we probably wouldn't be teaching this lesson tonight because I would have locked in on Jesus as a priest. And so leaving that alone, um, full disclosure, I missed it. It wasn't because I saw it and then went, no, I'm going to hold on to that. I just missed it. And then when I'm going through there today, you go, hey, that's a hapax. That word's never appeared before. It's the Greek word engios. E-N-G-Y-O-S would be the transliterated English. Um, it's a personal guarantee. It's what it sounds like. It's a surety. Jesus gives his personal guarantee. Um, it's really the old, the old word for bail, B-A-I-L. 
You know, we use that word now as bail bondsman. But bail is not money. It's that which guarantees that you're good for it. And so it's the old English word bail, but it's better translated for our purposes as the personal guarantee or surety. Jesus is a personal guarantee of a better covenant. So by using that word, a hey, pax, nobody had used that in the New Testament anywhere else. Why not? No one else is calling him priest either. So the author of Hebrews using words no one else has used to define who Christ is and what Christ does. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. There were many priests, but they all died. That's the simple way of saying that. All the priests always died. 24. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. To save to the uttermost. Um, to save completely or to save forever. It's not just the ends of the earth. It's kind of what it sounds like, to the uttermost. But to save forever and completely Whoever comes to God through him. By the way, there's no other way to come to God. <laughs> because of Jesus, there's no other way to come to God in relationship than through him since he always lives. Now, what I tell you earlier is that he had the power of an endless life. I told you to remember that because the author brings it back. He always lives to make intercession. I used to think, this is how I saw this verse. I used to think that what that means is that Jesus is always in front of God interceding for Paul. That's how I used to see this. Jesus, because I'm so bad at this, Jesus is constantly having to go to God going, Dad, he didn't mean that. He's, he's a pretty good kid. You know, I mean, he, he looks bad. He did some stupid stuff, but he's all right. You know, we, we talked and he's under the blood. I always had Jesus doing that to the, to the Father. And I did that long enough, and as that story continued, the only way I could figure Jesus had to keep doing that is because I kept ticking God off, which meant God was pretty easy to tick off because I wasn't really that bad. I mean, I knew what I was doing. It wasn't that bad. But if, but if everybody is there, then God's pretty easy to fire up. Well, imagine what these other sinners are doing to God. I mean, he's so angry, you know, no, no telling what he's going to do to them. And that becomes pretty easy preaching fodder. But I saw that that way. I literally had this image in the spirit realm that Jesus is always alive, ever lives to make intercession, means his whole life is just making intercession. Just running to dad, going, no, nope, don't. But first of all, God's, God and Jesus are not at odds. <laughs> so God isn't one way, Jesus is another way. And Jesus is acting as an agent of change on his father. Dad's mad, Jesus is cool. Dad's harsh, Jesus is mellow. No, they're one and the same. He ever lives to make intercession is that he's always alive. He outlasts you. See, you will not ever live. You will not live forever. Okay, he lives forever. He outlives all of us and in outliving us he lives ever on as priest let me let me let me let me, let me pause and really try to say this right let, let me let my next paragraph get me in the right space draw near to god we just read the ultimate priestly service of jesus fulfills the real purpose of the priesthood achieves the true ends of religion to find God. I did not accidentally put an S on the end of the word end. I did not mean for that to be singular and accidentally make it plural. Jesus is not the end of religion, per se. Religion still exists. Jesus, when seen as high priest, achieves the true ends of religion. What's religion trying to do? Find God. In being the high priest, Jesus finds him and finds him for us and reveals the heart of the Father to us. He does what the Aaronic priesthood could not, remove the barriers of sin and bring men to God. So let's say it this way. Christ fulfilled Adam's failed priesthood. 
Adam is a story that the Hebrews told as representative of mankind. The story of Adam and Eve, most of you followed our ministry long enough, I think you can handle me saying this. The story of Adam and Eve is not Israel's attempt to figure out how the world started. The story of Adam and Eve is a story that they tell to show how we all became what we are, a representative incident of all of us that we've turned from God and we've looked into our own self, our own tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, we wander far from the life of God and in our own nakedness, our own shame. Adam becomes the representative man of the human race, an, an analogy that Paul will use effectively multiple times. And most of the time, we're all real cool with that in Christian circles, as long as it just deals with sin. That Adam sinned and then everybody else is a sinner and that's why everybody's a sinner. We're not real cool with it when it deals with salvation, which Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Paul takes the Adam story and goes, if everybody's represented in one man named Adam, then because of the resurrection, everyone is now represented in a new man. Paul even calls him the last Adam, who is Christ. And therefore, Christ fulfills the priesthood, representing all of humanity to God. Adam fails. Christ comes and represents all of humanity to God and ever lives to do so lives on as the representative man. This is why I put in parentheses earlier. The priest is a mediator, parentheses, representative between God and man. He's not just mediating like a lawyer. Don't even think in those terms. He's representing man as now resurrected in front of the Father. I'm only just now, just now in my life, starting to get a little bitty taste of this. And I've had a... a what feels like a thousand iterations of the Christian faith. I've done this because I was scared not to. I've done this because I didn't think I could do anything else. I've done this because I thought I had to, because I was called. Um, but I do this because I'm convinced of Jesus. Now, really convinced of Jesus. I believe he's resurrected and I believe he is alive, but more than that, I believe he's the representative of all of humanity in front of the Father. That he stands in front of the Father as having stepped into the same death that all of humanity will step into and then raising them up. And that in him, we all stand boldly before the throne of grace without hanging our head because of Christ. So let's close the Hebrews account. There's a lot. So I just want to give you a few more, okay? The next chapter, we, we skip ahead just a little bit to Hebrews 8. This is the main point of the things we're saying. It's a good place to look how much he's worked all the way up to that one line. This is the main point. This is what I've been trying to say for eight chapters. This is the main point of the things we're saying. We have a high priest seated at the right hand of the throne. It goes right back to his first chapter right here. Seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. He's a minister of the sanctuary. But it's the true tabernacle. The one the Lord erected, not man. This is him pulling you away from the temple. Because this had nothing to do with the temple. Temple's probably still standing in Israel, in J Jerusalem, when Hebrews is written. Almost definitely still standing. And if that's the case, he's going, forget about the natural temple. This ain't what we're talking about. He's a minister of the sanctuary. Three. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it's necessary that this one, Jesus, he should also have something to offer. Because if he were on the earth, well, he wouldn't even be a priest. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Five who serve the copy, they serve the shadow of heavenly things. That's the temple. It's just a shadow. Moses was divinely instructed to build it when he was about to make the tabernacle. He said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he mediates a better covenant established on better promises. And why? Because the author opened the argument with a therefore in Hebrews 7. We read it. Therefore, if we've changed priests, We've changed law. If, this, if Aaron and the law surrounding Aaron is to prop up the Aaronic priesthood, and that's what we focused on, if we shifted our gaze and we found a new order, new order, what's the order? The order of Melchizedek. 
new priestly order. And if we have, then we can't use these laws to prop up this new order because it's old stuff. And he goes, and it's not. It's a better covenant built on better promises. Better covenant surrounded by better promises. Get out of the old so that you can get into the new. Okay, let me try to land it with this thought. I, I told you, I want to see if there's anywhere else in the New Testament where maybe there was a revelation that Jesus was priest. I missed this for a long time. And part of the reason is because I, for many, many years, only read one or two translations and didn't know much about Greek. And so would just have to say, take whatever was on the page. And as you begin to study and realize, A, it wasn't written in English, <laughs> B, it was written in Greek, but even in the Greek, stuff got picked up and dropped and picked up and dropped and picked up and dropped. And so some of the translations try to be a little more faithful to the oldest they can get. One of the reasons I like to read the NRSV, the New Revised Standard, is not because it's some sort of perfect translation, far from it, but because it tries where it can to use the oldest Greek manuscript we have. And then they put that into the translation. And that causes a lot of people trouble when they read it and go, that's not what my Bible said. And, and so just realize that when you're reading it. They're trying to pull from older texts. Okay, when you do that in the NRSV, using both the Septuagint to translate the Old Testament and using the oldest Greek text you can find to translate the New, I think you have a moment where a New Testament character declares Jesus to be a priest. Here's the Old Testament first. Think about the fact that the Jews of the first century knew their songbook, right? We've done this many times. They know their songbook. Psalms 106, 16. They were jealous of Moses in the camp and of Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. Old King James, New King James, Aaron, the servant of the Lord. Okay. Septuagint, Old Greek. Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. Jesus feeds 5,000, goes to sleep, wakes up the next day. Big part of the crowd come back for breakfast. Jesus goes, you guys aren't here because of the words I spoke to you or what I can do for you. You're just here to eat. And he goes, I tell you what, this kingdom that I'm bringing is more than filling your bellies. Because if filling your bellies is the end of this, we're never going to be able to accomplish this. I got something better for you. I got true manna. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have my life in you. And this bothers people. It bothers them for a couple of reasons. Because Jesus sounds like a cannibal and a vampire. This is the kind of stuff cult leaders say. And that, that struggle, they struggle with it. And the second reason it bothers them is because it's an invitation to a covenant meal. And they already have a covenant with Yahweh and Moses. And so Jesus is offering his body and his blood. That's Passover talk. So most everybody leaves Jesus at the end of John 6. Most of them do. And so Jesus turns to the ones that are left. There's not many. It's something when you run your church from 5,000 tw down to 12. Like no one writes a book on how to do that. How can we go from 5,000 to 12 and let's do it in like 24 hours, the Jesus style. <laughs> and, and it's not, it's, I know I'm being melodramatic there, but, but the reality is, is that people will follow for a lot of fantastic things. And then comes the words of Jesus and the words of Jesus are a little different story. And so he turns to his disciples and goes, you guys are going to leave too. In John chapter six, verse 67, Jesus says, do you wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You'll miss this in King James, New King James, because he says, we've come to believe that you're Christ. And that's what I taught to you when we taught John 6. You're the Christ. But the oldest Greek we have, which the NRSV grabs, has Peter saying, you are the Holy One. The exact same phrase. That is Psalms 106, 16 to describe Aaron. And nobody else had ever done this with Jesus. It's very likely that what Peter is doing is giving a New Testament revelation of an Old Testament word about Aaron to say, you are a priest. Where are we going to go? We have the priest. You're the representative of all of us to God. If we leave you, who represents us before God? We've come to believe and know that you're the Holy One of God, but notice why. Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Hearing you speak puts life inside of us, which is exactly what priests were supposed to do. 
Men have always looked to priests to speak words of eternal life over them, for priests to absolve them, to forgive them of their sins. Peter says it first of Jesus. Jesus as priest speaks words over us, removing our guilt. This is the priestly role of getting rid of your guilt, combating your guilt. And how? In John 15, in the famous I'm the vine, you're the branches passage, Jesus says, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. And how dare John, the gospel of John, do this? I'm tongue in cheek, I'm saying. How dare he do this? Jesus hasn't died yet. And John has Jesus declaring people clean because he speaks over them. He doesn't have to go to the cross to clean the world. He has to go to the cross to step into the world's death. All he has to do to clean the world is speak because out of him flows rivers of living water. He is the sound of God. He isn't going to affect God to go die so God will stop being mad. Before he ever goes to the cross, he's cleaning people off. To the woman caught in the act of adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and send no more. If that's not cleaning her off, what is? Everywhere he turns, he's cleaning us with his word. And this is why. One of a thousand reasons why we need prayer lives. That we need to be listening to Jesus. Because what he will do to us is clean us off with his word. He will wash us. He will cleanse us. He'll be the priest. Now, I don't have anything against my Catholic friends or, or, or any Christian tradition that goes to a priest to be absolved. I realize, actually, there's, it's quite powerfully cathartic to walk into a space and sit down, no doubt, and to say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. And then them say to you, you are forgiven. And you believe it. And you walk out and go, I'm forgiven. And we evangelicals and Protestants don't, we don't practice that because we go, well, a priest can't forgive you. Okay. I agree with you. Some, a priest forgiving you isn't Jesus forgiving you. I, I, I will concede that. But you got to admit, there's something pretty powerful that happens to those who believe they are forgiven. Let me say that again. Something pretty powerful happens to those who believe they are forgiven. See what I said? They believe they are forgiven. How? Because of words spoken over them by their priest. So what if you could believe in Jesus, ever living, to make intercession, to constantly speak over you who you are? Then maybe you could believe you are forgiven. So this is why Jesus the priest is an important lesson. Because it lets you have a priest who never goes to sleep. Not to affect an angry God, but to constantly speak over you the words of life. The words that you need to know you're not condemned. It's why Paul's, the author of Hebrews' culminating argument is, okay, we've been trying to say this, we have a high priest. Paul's argument, as far as I'm concerned, is, therefore, no condemnation in Christ. Like, in light of all of this, no condemnation in Christ. Now, that's, that's a priest. That's some words being spoken over us. So we try to make some connections tonight. Try to show you why Hebrews thinks Jesus is a priest. Try to connect that to the Old Testament. We've tried to show you Hebrews' argument of Jesus being a high priest. Didn't do it exhaustively. And yes, we missed some, priest, some priestly prophetic words. Some of my favorite are from Zechariah. We only have so much time to do this. We're going to do it one night. Um, and we tried to land on the fact that I don't think Hebrews is alone. I actually think Peter has a revelation of, of Jesus as a priest. He never comes out and says it, but he uses the terms. And in doing so, he says it from the speaking. Your words do it. Because that's the word spoken over them by the priest. And whether you believe all of that or that moves you or doesn't move you, it's neither here nor there. What I pray is that you can see that you have a representative in front of the Father. If you can see Jesus as being really good at what he does, <laughs> that Jesus is a resurrected man, that Jesus is beloved of the Father, even if you struggle to think you are and you struggle to think you're forgiven, may you start by seeing Jesus. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
That way, if you struggle with thinking you're righteous or you struggle with thinking you're forgiven, you go, I can't be. God can't possibly think of me that way. Fine. I disagree with you, but that's you. Okay, I can't make you feel a certain way. But if you can at least believe that Jesus is good in front of the Father, it's a great place to start. Because then you can at least go in through Jesus and say, which by the way, is the only way to get in anyway. <laughs> Understand? It's the only way to get in anyway. You, you coming to the knowledge of what you are is a great revelation. But whether you ever come to that knowledge or not, if you can acknowledge that Jesus is the representative man. What a powerful, powerful revelation. Let's pray. Let's pray not just for us. This is how we've, I've been really approaching this series. But pray for those who watch and who listen, who have come looking for this very title. Maybe they need to see Christ as priest. Father, thank you for this word tonight that I think has been, it's impacted me today. It, it stirred over me and it's been a word that I'm not even really sure what out of it is fresh that I need to swallow that I haven't fully in the past. And so I still await you to bring that revelation to me. But wherever I'm in the weeds on that, don't have it figured out. I still believe you are. Everything this says you are. You're my high priest. And I'll start there. You're the author and you're the finisher. And I pray that for every person that's watched or listened to Jesus the priest, that they can see Jesus as the representative of humanity. And if they can, whether they got all that figured out or not, they may not even know the theology behind it. Can't quote three verses to prove it, but they believe that Jesus is that high priest. Then, Father, may that begin the beginning. May that be the beginning of their rest and knowing that it's all about Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.